risk reduction uh, strategies uh, and the human rights-based approach. Uh, this webinar today will be divided in three parts. We will have the honor and the privilege to have with us uh, um, Mr. Marcos Orellana, that is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Implication for the Human Rights of the Environmentally Sound Management and Disposal of uh, Hazardous Substances and Wastes. Then we will have a presentation made by me, by me and by myself and uh, my colleague Amelie Tufik of the BRS Secretariat. And then we will uh, give a time to discuss with you. You can post the, all your question in the chat or in the Q&A section. So feel free also during the, uh, the, our presentation to write. And then at the end, we will uh, reply uh, to your question, uh, hope uh, um, to solve some doubts and clear some doubts. We will also include in the chat an evaluation questionnaire for um, evaluate, uh, let's say like for know you better and also for give us some um, feedback for improve our next uh, webinars. So now I give the floor to uh, Mr. Marcos Reyana for the opening remarks. So nice to see you and uh, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. Uh, and the honor and privilege is really mine to be able to join you today in this uh, conversation on what is a, a very timely topic, uh, highly hazardous pesticides, uh, pesticides more generally, and a rights-based approach with a focus on vulnerable groups. That is what I'll be addressing. Um, as Nadia mentioned, my name is Marcos Orellana. I'm the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Toxics and human rights. <clears throat> this is a mandate that uh, has been around for 25 years and it started with a focus on hazardous waste uh, and in 2011 it was expanded and reframed and renewed by consensus by the Human Rights Council to address the life cycle of chemicals and wastes. And this is a very important development because the challenges that are upon us uh, in, in the face of the toxification of the planet, alongside climate change, alongside biodiversity loss, are incredibly serious. The, the mandate works to uphold the right of everyone to live in a toxic free environment. This is no doubt a challenge in the face of more than 350,000 chemicals that are out in the market uh, with scarce information or risk evaluation. And within that constellation of chemicals, highly hazardous pesticides are a matter of global concern. We are concerned, for example, in what we see are double standards in the export of pesticides that are prohibited for use and consumption for environmental and health reasons in their country of origin, and yet they are exported to countries in the global south. The example of the pesticide Paraquat and the breakdown of the science policy interface um, is, is that would otherwise lead to controls, effective controls, is a matter of concern. So in the minutes that I have today with you, I would like to expand on what is a rights-based approach? What are its elements? And the first point of departure is to note the impacts of pesticides on people and especially on children and other vulnerable groups. Because there are on, on the impacts on health, for example, very serious diseases that are caused by exposure to pesticides, whether it's cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, there's also hormone disruption, developmental disorders and sterility. There are neurological effects with memory loss, loss of coordination, reduced motor skills and chronic effects. It's not only acute exposure, but also years after exposure, impacts maybe began to be seen visible. So there are serious consequences for the right to health and these impacts are particularly severe for children because of their biology. They have smaller organ size and they also lack the key enzymes that, are, that enable the human body to detoxify pesticides. 
the International Labour Organization estimates that about 60% of child laborers work in agriculture and especially in developing countries. So one can already see how severe this problem is. There are numerous instances of aerial spraying on top of communities and on top of schools. There's also instances of food that is contaminated with residues. And this has impacts then on uh, children and other vulnerable groups. And among which we can count workers. Workers are exposed on a daily basis to highly hazardous pesticides. Protective equipment is often not available uh, it is often said that uh, the, uh, the workers could uh, read labels or inform themselves about the dangers of pesticides, but uh, a rights-based approach puts the focus not on the user, but on the producer, on the parties that have the ability to make a difference. Uh, in that regard, it's important for me to note that highly hazardous pesticides cannot be safely used. This is a very important point that I wish to highlight. Uh, so children, workers, but also women may be in certain stages of their lives, also a, a vulnerable group uh, in pregnancy, lactation, menopause, where women's bodies are also more susceptible to the impacts of exposure to highly hazardous pesticides. 85% of women apply pesticides in the fields, in open fields, working in agriculture, also working in, in, in greenhouses, cultivating flowers. It is often the case that uh, women so employed are temporary workers without adequate social security protections. So what does a rights-based approach require in dealing with these impacts on people and especially vulnerable groups? A rights-based approach, if we were to distill it down given the time, we can identify that it uh, provides a framework for rights and obligations. It provides a set of principles that guide state action it provides a focus on vulnerable groups. And I'll elaborate uh, succinctly on each of these points. Uh, a framework of rights and obligations. So this is establishing a vertical approach between the state and the individual or the group for the protection and respect of the rights to life, the right to health, the right to science, the right to housing, the right to a healthy environment. Uh, I've uh, already presented some of the impacts that exposure to pesticides may have on each one of these rights. So that's the rights and the obligation distilled down to the obligation of the state to prevent exposure to hazardous substances. This is a very schematic but and succinct rights and obligations framework. There's a clear identification of who has rights and who has obligations. And then we can talk about principles that inform a rights-based approach. The principles of information, access to information, the right to know, the right to know about the risks that one is facing in the workplace, in the consumption of certain products, in regards to other activities of, of daily life and the right to participate in decision-making processes, democratic inclusion. Uh, this is a universal principle whereby every person has an aspiration of having agency over what happens in their lives, of communities taking agency over matters that may impact them in order to address uh, risks. And then accountability as a principle, the right to an effective remedy. If somebody suffers harm, if there is a violation, the right to a remedy is a key dimension of accountability and of the rights-based approach. Rights and obligations, principles, a focus on vulnerable groups as an element of the rights-based approach. I've talked about children, workers, women, they deserve special measures of protection. Society must look at those in most vulnerable situations to avoid harm. And this is where 
there's an instrument of international human rights law that has wide ratification that is very important for the protection of children, which is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. This convention provides for the right to health, for example, the right to maximum development of the child, the right to be heard, the right to personal integrity. This provides a normative framework that has enabled treaty organs at the international level to recommend effective measures of protection, both within and beyond boundaries of states to um, vulnerable populations. So for example, in 2015, the Committee on the Rights to the Child recommendations to Mexico regarding the import of prohibited pesticides. Or more recently in 2018, the Human Rights Committee hearing a case involving Paraguay and exposure of people there to pesticides, the affirmation of the right to life in dignity. There's so much more that could be said in terms of uh, the rights-based approach, but because of time, uh, I would like to point out a couple challenges and synergies. Challenges in that the international community has yet to grapple effectively with the problem of highly hazardous pesticides. There has been movement in that direction, but much remains to be done. And this has impacts on the ability to secure a non-toxic, a toxic-free environment for all. That's a huge challenge. But there are opportunities as well, or there are synergies. There's the potential, for example, of thinking about a gender action plan on chemicals and wastes that may focus or have an element on pesticides. There are also opportunities for overcoming silos, for enhancing coordination between human rights and the environment and the rights-based approach to capture efficiencies, to avoid duplication, to secure coherence. So this is a matter of, of normative dialogue, as it were. For example, the rights of future generations or the precautionary principle, the integration of environment and human rights under a paradigm of sustainable development. Of course, international cooperation is critical to advance this line of thinking and action. Uh, I will move now to conclude uh, and only to reaffirm that the mandate on toxics and human rights is focused in its work on securing a right to a healthy environment, including a ri the right to a toxic free environment. And this has huge implications for the issue that we're talking about today, highly hazardous pesticides. And in order to secure that right, the implementation of a rights-based approach to highly hazardous pesticides is an essential tool that uh, governments should implement in order to secure adequate protection to people under their jurisdiction, especially children and especially vulnerable groups. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. I um, go back to you, Nadia, thank you. Thank you, Marco Sariana, for this valuable contribution, also for giving us um, like a, a great overview on the principles of the human, human rights-based approach, also stress how the importance of the legal framework, and then of course, identifying challenges that we know that there is something to do, but it's nice to see that uh, there are also solutions, and then we can also work together in the in synergy. So thanks for this and give hope uh, to the work that can be done together. So feel free to stay here. And then if uh, also the participants who want to ask something later, uh, we can uh, try to clear some doubts together. Thank you. I will uh, now share my screen. Um, we will have a joint presentation here. Okay, so we will have a joint presentation uh, on behalf of the Secretariat of the Rotterdam Convention, myself and Amelie Tufik. I will start with an overview of the agricultural sector. We know uh, some key facts about the agricultural sector. 
we need to um, highlight that half of the global workforce estimated that 1.3 billion workers worldwide is, employ is employed in the agricultural uh, sector. But agriculture, uh, unfortunately, is one of the three most dangerous uh, sectors uh, at any age uh, in terms of work-related illnesses, uh, accidents, and deaths. And pesticides are considered one of the most risks for the health of rural um, workers and the surrounding communities. I want uh, to... Um, Mm, this, as you know, this is a, an image um, uh, showing uh, the life in a farm. Uh, usually these are different activities and tasks for different people that are in the workers or community nearby. And I want to play a game with you for uh, the ability to identify what are the exposure scenarios. You can see now a poll. I will start this poll. So in your screen will appear like uh, a question with some answers. So please uh, try to reply and then we will see the results. So if we can able to identify, if you cannot look the screen, you can also put down and then look better the, the image. Okay, we are seeing some votes. I will wait a little bit. Okay, let's try. Don't be shy. We have still uh, some time. Okay, I see some results going in. The number is increasing. I will leave you some more uh, seconds for finalizing. Okay. Look at the different... Uh, situation, sorts of danger that can be, um, uh, can appear here. Good. Okay, we are like almost all. Fine. So I will uh, end the poll and then we show you the results if someone guessed or not. Share the results. The results say 11, um, but the correct answer is 14. So many times, like also some armless uh, task can be considered um, dangerous, is dangerous, even if uh, seems harmless. For example, this uh, lady that is washing the clothes, we have to know that like these uh, uh, clothes are um, contaminated. So uh, this can be also an, an exposure for her. These are the situation. These are the 14 situations of danger that are experienced the people in the farm. Uh, someone like harvesting or only some bathing uh, close to an area that is recently, uh, re recently sprayed. This is only for saying to you that uh, the exposure can be direct and direct on farm. So while doing different type of tasks, we saw mixing and applying pesticides, but also returning to the field for more work or harvest where it was recently sprayed or handling empty pesticides for different use. Also in some countries, we know that there is a risky, very risky, uh, dangerous practice of using for water or food storage, something that should uh, be avoided. And then washing also contaminate laundry, like uh, mixing the normal clothes with the, the work clothes. But exposure can be also off farm. So um, in markets, for example, repackaging pesticide containers for alternative use. These pictures are real and have been taken in a market where pesticides were sold in a small essential oil containers. So these you can see banana and vanilla essence, but is not these the um, 
the, um, uh, the liquid inside. Then there is also a lack or limited protective equipment also for the sellers. And uh, there is a lack of training on pesticide application, storage and disposal. And many times what we find in the, um, in the countries is uh, there is no uh, label uh, available in the language, in the local language, but only in foreign languages. And in many cases, there is an illegal repackaging like this one. So during the um, Rotterdam Convention technical assistance, we have tried to merge the different challenges that the occupational safety and health uh, sector face. So the first one is the inadequate protection of agriculture's agricultural workers under uh, labor um, law. So many times the OSH, um, the OSH um, legislation exclude the, the workers of the agricultural sector. Or in general, the labor law does not uh, consider the uh, agricultural working in it. So the informal sector, they consider it as an informal sector. Then in incorrect application of the applicable law, this means that also labor inspectors many times can rarely visit the, the farmers for um, also for um, due to different reasons, for lack of training, for lack of resources, for moving. And then there is a lack of accessibility to and an affordability of the prices of PPEs, of the personal protective equipment are too high for being um, bought by the farmers. And then we have unfortunately limited data and research on the extent and the severity of agricultural worker related incidents, illnesses and uh, injuries. Many times we have anecdotal uh, stories, but um, we need to collect more data for, heavy, for having uh, evidences for also bringing uh, a better policy work. I want to um, start today, like um, has already Marco Sorellana did in, uh, in his um, overview, uh, stress out the importance of the vulnerability also and the exposure to, to pesticides. Not everyone is equally exposed to the impact of pesticides and it's important to identify the most vulnerable individuals and groups and in this way also try to find what are the strategies that can reduce the risks. The concept of vulnerability needs to be uh, um, thought in two ways. It's not only a biological vulnerability, but it's also linked to the some social economic uh, characteristic reasons uh, that can increase the um, poverty and the food insecurity. For example, um, among those at risk, most at risk, uh, um, it, it, it is important to highlight that there are some groups that are more vulnerable than others. And in rural area, for example, um, this, the situation is exacerbated because uh, the access to decent work opportunities and health and safety information is limited. With the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic, we also uh, saw an increase of the vulnerabilities and the inequalities, especially in the, in the rural areas. I want to focus, it was already mentioned by um, Marco Sreyana, the, the focus on some certain vulnerable groups. The first one that we want to use as a, a case study, let's say, it's uh, the work on children. So children are for biological, but also for social reasons, are more vulnerable than others. As children body and minds are still growing, they are more, particularly sensitive to the toxic effects of, uh, of pesticides. Also, the organs can be less able to detoxify the um, pesticides. And currently also, a very sad um, figure is the 71% of child labor is carried out in the agricultural sector. And uh, almost half of the world child labor is considered hazardous, including the um, uh, handling of pesticides. But children can be 
exposed to pesticides in different way, uh, in different ways directly by mixing, so by working, by mixing and applying them, but also indirectly in some harmless uh, um, situation that can be playing in the fields where pesticides have been used or at home uh, where pesticides are stored in uh, containers not uh, safely um, locked. Another group um, is the rural women. Uh, women are particularly at high risk during the childbearing uh, years, especially during uh, pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding. Even low doses uh, can have irreversible effects on women and their unborn offspring. As it was mentioned, there are serious consequences for women's health, cancer, especially of the breast, uh, pesticide on breast um, milk, um, higher risk of endometriosis, uh, infertility, spontaneous uh, abortion. But also when we talk about women, we have also to consider the um, potential impacts on babies, uh, premature uh, birth, uh, peri um, perinatal death, neurological problems. <laughs> Women are part of the old life cycle of the chemical uh, product uh, management and the impact can be in different phases in the production, as we see, where women are highly exposed to dangerous chemicals or during the use in the application, but also after the use at the end of the product's life. <laughs> For example, when uh, women are exposed to, um, to hazardous uh, pesticides when harvesting or cleaning uh, used pesticides, we have to also stress out that um, women uh, um, face uh, uh, the, the crisis also due to the COVID-19 has a female uh, face. Let's say the COVID affects everyone, but not everyone. The, same level and the um, pandemic is deepening pre-existing inequalities. Nearly 60% of women work in informal uh, sector, earning less, having less access to uh, training, to resources. So this uh, is for them a higher, um, a greater risk of falling into poverty. So these are also things that needs to be considered into account. The third group of focus of today is, are the migrants and the seasonal workers. We know that labor migration is an essential component of rural development and the agri-food system. Also with the pandemic, if we are talking about uh, this, um, this year, this strange year, has highlighted the critical role of migrants and seasonal workers that play in our food system. Uh, as well as the importance of remittances for household uh, food security and the resilience to shock. It also uh, drew the attention to the deficit of the system. What are the deficit of uh, the decent work opportunity in the sector? And many, many vulnerabilities of the migrant works. We know that often they are victims of various human rights violations. I will now focus, uh, I will leave the floor to my colleague um, Amelie for um, keep on uh, with the presentation on the human rights based approach. Amelie, it's yours, the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today and thanks to Marcos uh, for his brilliant introduction as usual. Um, now the, uh, the presentation will focus more, uh, being myself a, a legal officer, on, on some legal aspects of, uh, of the question we're looking at today. And um, first I wanted to start by linking the human rights-based approach and uh, what exists in terms of, of human rights in, in, in the human rights community and what's the link with the Rotterdam Convention as well as the two other sister conventions um, in synergies with them, uh, the Basel and Stockholm Conventions, and show how they are linked to human rights. Because um, a few years ago, and it was uh, before the adoption of the um, 
2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development by the UN General Assembly. I would hear something that I don't hear anymore now. What's the link between the BRS conventions and human rights? Well, first look at uh, the, the common objectives, which is indeed the same, exactly the same for the three of them, which is the protection of human health and of the environment against the adverse effect of um, hazardous substances and, and in these cases chemicals including pesticides and wastes for the Basel Convention. So which rights, which rights are affected? If you decide to protect human health, of course it's about the right to life, the right to health and one new uh, right, uh, although recognized by, by a lot of jurisdictions around the world and officially recognized at the UN level for children last year, the right to a healthy environment. There's also, um, and when I'm quoting these rights, the, these rights are actually enshrined in fundamental uh, UN treaties, other treaties than the BRS conventions, which are human rights specific treaties. Um, and uh, later on, you will see in the, the bibliography a reference, specific reference to the list of all these UN treaties, which are deposited in New York with the treaty sections on behalf of the Secretary General. So um, since the creation of the UN, there have been uh, several international legal instruments, uh, most of them legally binding, which have embodied all these rights that I'm listing now. And apart from the ones that I've mentioned, you can add the right to development, uh, which was born a few decades ago uh, with the Declaration on the Right to, to Development, and which is everywhere underlying the uh, 2015 um, uh, resolution of the UN General Assembly on Sustainable Development. There's also the right to food security, which is very relevant for the FAO. Um, the right to clean water and sanitation, the right to an adequate standard of living, to education, etc. And these are among the many other fundamental, uh, not only uh, civil and political rights, but also the economic, social and cultural rights that are enshrined in legally binding UN uh, instruments. There's also, in addition, the right not to be economically exploited, in particular children, and the right to education. Um, more recently, there, there has been a call to action for human rights a year ago by uh, the UN Secretary General, which recalls all what I would call is the DNA uh, of the United Nations. Uh, and these, uh, the notions and the human rights based approach is indeed um, founded on the cornerstone, uh, one of the first cornerstone. Uh, of the UN well first its charter the then later on the the universal declaration on on human rights and uh, as mentioned uh, earlier uh, you may find uh, in the presentation that uh, will be sent to you a link to all these uh, these treaties and you may also wish to have a look uh, again at the 17 sustainable development goals uh, on the relevant uh, UN web page that uh, uh, enshrine uh, uh, different uh, aspects of developments and uh, under which uh, human rights are underlying. And next, uh, uh, to explain to you uh, the, uh, better what the human rights-based approach and protection uh, on which you can found better protection against exposure um, uh, towards hazardous pesticides, how uh, and why uh, still the Rotterdam Convention is linked to this, which vulnerabilities. So last year we, we delivered a series of webinars uh, focusing on children, which is when, when we think of vulnerability, we think first um, of children. But um, there are also other uh, individuals or groups uh, who may be considered, who are considered uh, by, by the UN, even um, under the BRS conventions. There's, uh, if I recall the, the exact uh, uh, wording in the Stockholm Convention, 
is also referring to these vulnerable communities, for example, of the Arctic, um, who may be more affected by the issue and the question of pesticides. Um, of course, there are gender issues in, in this, and, and, and Nadia explained also why technically, and, and Marcos in his intervention, why physically and biologically, a certain categories like women, girls can be more affected. Of course, there are social issues as well, and the poor um, and other groups like ethnic minorities, I mentioned the Arctic population, uh, with regard to pops, persistent organic pollutants under the Stockholm Convention, uh, which may be more affected because of the uh, naturally the um, going toward the transplantary movements of, of these uh, chemicals and including pesticides with through air, water and land towards the poles. Uh, there are also among these vulnerable um, individuals and groups, disabled people, and, and the COVID-19 crisis has shown has even exacerbated their vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities of uh, these groups who in, in um, more normal circumstances are already considered as vulnerable migrants, uh, foreigners, and uh, as far as our uh, topics uh, gathers us uh, today and, and, and concern and is concerned the rural communities because of uh, the obvious use of pesticides in their activities on a daily basis. The as I was mentioning a few minutes ago, uh, the impact of the COVID-19 uh, health and sanitary crisis worldwide has increased these vulnerabilities and therefore um, they, they, they require even more protection in the present circumstances and, and why we're talking about human rights uh, based approach regarding pesticides, regarding their, their environmental cell management is that it's because it may be a tool and it may be an approach that helps indeed in, um, in fulfilling the, the primary objective of the convention, which is the protection of, of human health and of the environment in particularly critical circumstances and the present ones are uh, even more critical um, and uh, are, are showing the relevance of uh, having an approach based on the individual, based on, on human uh, considerations of, of the issue, their health, their life, all what I've mentioned um, in terms of rights that are now uh, 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 have been enshrined for a few decades. Um, how is the Rotterdam and the Beerance conventions relating to economic, social and cultural conditions, which may hamper vulnerable individuals? Well, for example, uh, and well, I've mentioned the, the difference in particular, the, the, the local community, the ethnic minorities, which may under a certain jurisdiction have less means or tools um, uh, to protect themselves. And as mentioned, the, the persons living in precarious conditions, economic conditions, uh, they are, uh, as, uh, as are also uh, um, uh, exposed, there, there are high gender issues in, in this question, gender equality and parity uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this particular uh, question. Uh, next. Uh, so now that we have looked at what the state of play and, and, and what the linkages between uh, the convention which, um, which interests us and the human rights base, what role can, can be played by the vulnerable individual or groups themselves, in particular children, even if they are not a uh, major of age, they can be agents of change in favor of their environment. And it starts by, uh, well, adapting the curriculum to, to transmit a proper education and knowledge and access to information because uh, caring for these generations is caring for the future. And you have to, to start uh, actually from an early age uh, to grant them access to information, education, 
uh, they also have in certain ways the right to participate and uh, to acquire the necessary skills to develop um, uh, and address the environmental uh, issues. And, and we've seen that at the level of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, this, this UN organization, uh, you've probably heard in the press that a group of children actually filed uh, a complaint in terms of climate change and of, of the um, infringement of their basic rights if the question of climate change is not addressed and the question of pesticide chemicals and waste is linked to to cl climate change and uh, needs to, and now it's it's obvious for everyone it needs to be properly addressed including uh through a human rights based approach because if you follow and 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 respect sdgs and implement them uh, adequately uh by the same way you ensure that human rights are actually uh, fulfilled and in the end the objective and the end result it's the the improvement of the well-being and of the life and of the health um of these in especially the most vulnerable individual groups which may be more affected by the question uh, and the exposure to to pesticides and uh, next what other agents or the agents of change can uh, enter into play well of course the role played by parties to the Rotterdam conventions uh, and the other sister conventions the Basel and, and Stockholm conventions by acting in accordance with the obligations which have been subscribed under uh, the BRS conventions the Rotterdam convention as to um, preventing the environmentally sound management of, of pesticides and other chemicals and in conjunction with uh, with the other treaties that uh, the government the parties uh, the same parties have actually ratified under the auspices of the United Nations so it, here it is about connecting the dots in and not having a fragmented framework of and silos and overcoming silos that may exist between uh what i heard and i quote the human rights community the environment community the trade community uh in the end we're all on the same planet and these are issues which cross border and if we want to be effective in in, in the outcome that we wish to to achieve uh we have to be coherent and and therefore um Parties have an important role to play in connecting the dots in between all uh, the implementation of all these obligations, which are a bit everywhere in different international legal instruments, multilateral, uh, not only multilateral environmental treaties like the Rotterdam Convention, but uh, the other treaties like the, the human rights treaties. And um, if if you would recall, if you at the beginning of the presentation, I've mentioned that the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment is a new right that, I mean, new, not under a lot of national jurisdiction, which, which have um, explicitly um, uh, recognized these rights in their own uh, legislation, but, or even constitutions or other instruments, but at the global level. And last year in 2020, uh, uh, milestones have been uh, reached by the Human Rights Council because it's indeed adopted a resolution on this particular human environmental human right for children as it relates to children. So in the applicable policies, how, how can the dots can be further connected in, uh, in the applicable policies? It's about leaving the one behind. Having in mind, again, I'm, I'm repeating, and referring again to the 2030 uh, agenda for sustainable uh, development i've also i have included a reference that you may find in the um, on the last page of the presentation for uh, for your reference concrete human rights indicators that can be used in uh, policies to measure progress realized so i really invite you to uh, consult uh, this document i realize there's a uh, a reference to the French version, but if you just replace FR by EN, 
uh, and it's mentioned properly in the bibliography, then you will have access to the, the English version of these two. Next, please. Um, what other agents of change can actually have a role to play, in particular as to pesticides? It's the industry, the private sector, any other stakeholders, the non-governmental, like the civil society. And uh, the trend now is to, to have multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships involving governments, involving um, the private sector, IGOs, to in the end works towards the same direction and, and the same goals, because each angle has its, its contribution to bring uh, in to, to tackle these, these global uh, issues. And uh, this is why more and more there, there is a lot of work being done with the businesses. There are specific, um, there are specific work which is being done on business and human rights, for instance, and business and human rights and children, in particular towards the more most vulnerable. To conclude on this part, um, well, you're hearing a lot about, about vaccines these days, and I would like to quote, um, well, there is a vaccine to hunger, inequality, poverty, and, and probably climate change. Um, as well as too many ills that humanity is facing, including the pesticides um, issues. Um, this is a vaccine developed at the wake of massive global shocks, including pandemics and, and financial crisis and, and two world wars. And the name of this vaccine is not new, it's human rights. So I wanted to end uh, this part uh with this quote because i think uh it, it's it, it it really calls our attention so thank you for for your attention on this and i give the floor back to my colleague nadia thank you very much nadia thank you amelie um thank you for this um and i will focus now on the um, aspects more related uh, to the tools that have been developed in um, in these years for targeting these uh, uh, small groups. Um, the, the first one that I want to focus and show you is the visual facilitator's guide, Protect Children from Pesticides, that was um, tested for the first time in Mali and then adapted to various um, areas in different languages and also the in Latin American so Latin American Caribbean in Asia in uh, Africa Eastern Europe Middle East in different languages and we have multiple application and audiences so we have multiple application and audiences in school in the in the um, uh, agricultural um, extension agents the session uh, one, it's uh, composed by three different sections. The session one is um, uh, linked to how are children exposed to pesticides. So in the um, while cleaning and um, washing uh, during the preparation or the application of working in the field or using pesticide container, as I mentioned before. The second part is linked to, to the effects, the negative effects on, of pesticides on human health and uh, development. Why are children at greater uh, risk? So what are the immediate effects, but also what are the long-term effects uh, and why the vulnerability is uh, uh, increased? The third part is like a positive thought, like say, is like the way forward. What we can do as community to reduce the exposure of children to pesticides. Another tool that I want to show is the e-learning course on pesticide management and child labor prevention. This course also was uh, uh, developed by the Rotterdam Convention Secretariat together with the child labor in agriculture prevention team and the, um, um, also the support of ILO. And the course is tailored to meet the information of policymakers, program designers, researchers, and has 
has learning objective, uh, the possibility to recognize how it is uh, children and exposure to pesticides, why children are more vulnerable, what are the negative uh, uh, impacts of exposure. Then uh, I want only to share with you new um, new just uh, published uh, publication brochure. The first one is the technical note for agricultural stakeholder is uh, um, a brochure that uh, aim uh, different uh, agricultural stakeholder, giving them an array of information. Uh, regarding the um, hazardous pesticides, uh, the occupational safety measures, and how um, with these tools uh, they can uh, uh, address this issue. A second brochure is more an information note, is a call for action, uh, is for donors, is for acti um, activists uh, in the sector, and uh, how um, to know what is the role of FAO and what is the potential in addressing this issue for um, effective moving ahead with some projects. These tools have been also applied in, um, in different uh, projects, and I want to focus on two uh, types of projects that uh, the Rotterdam Convention have, uh, uh, has carried out. The first one focus on uh, rural communities, uh, in Guinea-Bissau, a group discussion with farmers from different regions took place with involvement of the Secretariat of the Rotterdam Convention, but also with the Minister of Agriculture, with the Plant Protection Department, and also local NGOs. The farmers were sensitized about the risk posed by hazardous pesticides, what are also the alternatives to, to them, and the Mm, it was done in a different um, uh, in different setting. As you can see, the first the first pictures uh, is we are in the um, in in a market. So while selling, in this case, the, these ladies were selling also pesticides and fertilizers in a small bags. Um, and uh, so we talk with them, and uh, but also the the, the awareness raising campaign was um, carried out in the already in the farm. Uh, then the community program was broadcasted on local radio, transmitting messages in local uh, language on the risk posed by hazardous pesticides, and also a video was uh, developed. But here we see a moment of the day of this rural community in the north of uh, Guinea-Bissau that they gather together in the afternoon for listening the radio uh, program, conveying some messages on the agricultural activities. A second uh, cases, so practical cases, is an uh, awareness raising uh, campaign done in Morocco with women. Um, the UN organized a stand for the International Agricultural Fair in Morocco in 2019, and some awareness raising campaign were um, conceived in collaboration with the UN Women, IOM, UNDP. Different uh, strategies that can be used also. It was um, used uh, the exercise of the body, body mapping for understanding uh, the uh, parts uh, that were involved in exposure, uh, the drawing of agricultural plots, uh, identify good and bad practices within the framework of the life cycle of pesticides. And then also a role play, so a theater with different um, uh, character um, playing the role of the sellers, uh, the buyer, or in the setting of the farm with the farmer and the other people involved. Now I leave the, just the floor to Amelie for explaining a little bit the bibliography. Amelie? Amélie? Yes, sorry. Okay. No, no problem. <laughs> I couldn't find again the, the icon. Um, yes, so um, throughout my, uh, my presentation, I've, I've mentioned a few of, of these sources. And the first one is um, 
you know, like the, the Rotterdam Convention and, um, and the Stockholm and Basel Conventions, they are actually um, kept by uh, like a treasure uh, by the UN Treaty section in, in New York. And uh, if you go on the website, there's like, a, I mean, I don't know how, how many pages, paper pages it would represent, but there are a series of chapters, environment, human rights, and uh, you may find the BRS conventions, but you may also find all uh, the relevant UN and legally binding multilateral human rights treaties there. So I've, uh, um, I've actually uh, inserted this reference, this first reference there. And if you go through them, like just the title, uh, you will see that they concern the most vulnerable groups that, uh, that we mentioned to date. So um, connecting the, to help connecting the dots, well, first, uh, having myself a legal background, we refer to the text and there are the texts, including all the environmental and a different chapter, but in the same compilation. Human rights indicators. So uh, I've also mentioned that these are, th this is nearly 200 pages actually, yeah. but at least it's very comprehensive. It provides concrete tools to measure progress and to include in policies, national policies. So here's the reference. Um, another, yeah, a key publication, sorry, I've left the, the words in French, a human rights based approach to data. Because what's what's key? I mean, you have to based on facts, uh, uh, the considerations, the measures, the analysis, the policies, um, leaving no one behind in the 2030 agenda. So, also, it's another resource to to help in in under the umbrella of the SDGs uh, to make a link and and uh, adequately implement measures to tackle the issue of, um, of the harmful effect of pesticides and at the same time following um, a human rights based approach. And as you would see uh, from uh, another sister organization, the World Health Organization, uh, there have been studies, scientific medical studies on the impact of, um, of hazardous substances, including pesticides on one of the most vulnerable children. Uh, so I've inserted this reference here as well. Also, of course, UNICEF is working a lot on these issues and focus, has focused particularly on, um, on children and, uh, and businesses, children's rights and businesses. Uh, there is also, there's also a guide, they provide a guide to um, to help integrating children's rights into policies, impact assessments, sustainability reporting. Um, and this is helpful not only for representative of parties, but uh, for all um, stakeholders. Uh, if you want to know more about the right to development, uh, there's also a resource uh, available, civil society and human rights, businesses and human rights. So you see it's really now more and more what is being done uh, is to really have a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, partnerships is a way of between all these different actors and possible um, agents of changes, including parties is to work together uh, towards uh, the same goals and uh, efficiently address the issues posed by, um, in our case today, exposure to pesticides. So children's rights and business principles, um, the impact of pesticide exposure on child laborers uh, in agriculture. This is a, an ILO uh, tool, realizing the rights of the child through a healthy environment. There, there has been a report by the, the high commissioner herself who initially was a pediatrician. I don't know if you know. And uh, this report actually fed the resolution that I've mentioned uh, earlier and the adoption of this revolution, uh, resolution, sorry, uh, in September, October, uh, if I remember correctly, yes. And the links to the works of the UN Special Rapporteurs, and you've heard one today, uh, Marcos, uh, and to what they're doing. Well, I've seen that I forgot to take off the FR, which will lead you to the French version, but it will lead you to a page where you can choose in between 
uh, the six official languages of, of, of the UN and you will easily access to the English versions. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will give back the floor to my dearest colleague Nadia. And if you have any questions, feel, please do feel free whether now or even um, later by emails. If you have second thoughts, uh, we're happy to help. Thank you. Thank you, Amélie. Uh, thank you all the panelists for uh, this uh, overview and also for going in details on uh, this topic. Um, I don't see, I, I don't know if someone, I don't see at the moment uh, questions. I don't know if someone wants to post uh, some question or want to intervene. We can also give the floor in case if you want to share some, pre, um, some um, experience on this. Otherwise, we will be recording. We have recorded this uh, uh, webinar. We will upload into the RC webinar, uh, RC, sorry, website. And then you can write to us, uh, to Marco Sereyana and uh, for further clarification. I will wait some moments more if someone wants to intervene or like uh, pose some question otherwise let also the other uh, panelists uh, um, if they want to say something more i don't see questions or so uh amelie marcos do you want to add something or we can finish since we are also a little bit beyond the time schedule for today. Um, yes, I just wanted to thank everyone, uh, the panelists, uh, the great help we've had from colleagues uh, and the attendees for taking the time uh, to, to come here today. Um, I know some people are already uh, uh, taking a break uh, this week. So, um, Thank you again, and uh, please don't hesitate to to come back to us with uh, with any questions, whether now or or later. Thank you very much. I see only one uh, question in the chat, or like a thought about Safta Della. I read, uh, you have in your country the labeling of the production farm and of the treatment applied, for example, to apples. I don't know if someone wants to explain to answer to this or if Safta wants to explain better this. Safta, do you want the floor for like uh, uh, explaining better your question? I can try to give you the right to talk if you want to share your experience or like to pose your question to us. Safta, if you want, I allow you to talk if you want to share with us this. Otherwise, feel free. It's okay. We will try to. I don't know if the other. Oh. Thank you. Safta, can you hear us? Safta? Safta Della? Okay. I don't know, maybe it doesn't. Okay. So we will, uh, I don't know if the other panelists uh, understood exactly what. Uh, uh, the question means or like how we want to reply or otherwise we will find a good way for answering you okay so i don't see other um i don't see other yeah nobody asking for the floor so i think we can uh uh close here the session today and uh, we are happy to having you here participating so like thanks for 
for taking the time to listen to this and uh, we will uh, we will be available in case you want uh, um, other further clarification thank you have a good uh, day rest of the day thank you bye bye